be here. Um, although I'm kind of amazed, the first uh, I gave a talk at Usenix Security in 1999, and the only difference in the title would have been that it said the crypto wars because we thought we were in the crypto wars and we were finishing them. But here we are again. Um, so um, this is about Apple, or maybe it's about Apple. Um, all of you know the story of the San Bernardino case, uh, the locked phone uh, that belonged to the health department that was found. Uh, the, the two terrorists had destroyed their personal phones, but law enforcement found the locked phone. They came to Apple and said that only Apple could open the phone, and the way Apple was to open the phone was to provide an update to the phone that undid the, app, uh, the security protections. And Apple said, no, we're not willing to do that. Law enforcement said, you're obliged under the All Writs Act. The case went to court. Um, it went for a few weeks um, with appeals. And then the US said, hey, we might not need Apple to do it. So having said for weeks in court and in congressional testimony that only Apple could open the phone, law enforcement found that, in fact, somebody else could do it. Um, now, what came out this spring was an inspector general report that said, in fact, when law enforcement testified in Congress and when law enforcement uh, filed affidavits in court saying that only Apple could open the phone, they hadn't tried hard enough. Amy Hess, who was the science and technology executive at the time, got nervous in February 2016. She had testified in Congress. Comey had testified before Congress. Um, they had provided the technical information for the courts in California, and they had said, FBI was unable to open the phone, and only Apple could. But she got a little nervous that maybe FBI wasn't trying as hard as it could. FBI had two different divisions, the going dark division, which tries to undo the crypto, and the division that deals with consultants. The going dark division hadn't been able to open the phone. The division that deals with consultants was under the mistaken assumption that if they were able, if one of their consultants was able to open the phone, um, they would have to expose the technique in court, and because they dealt with national security investigations, they hadn't pushed. But the going dark group had not consulted with the other group to say, are you trying as hard as you can? Hess started asking questions. The consultant group went and asked their consultants. One of their consultants had been 90% of the way along, but had not put it as a priority because it looked like this wasn't an issue that, that FBI was particularly interested in. They, they prioritized other things. I don't know if that's the consultant that opened the phone or somebody else. In August, um, again, because Hess was at raising questions, uh, FBI initiated an inspector general report, um, and, and we know all this. One of the striking things about this was that when the phone got opened, the head of the going dark unit said to the other unit, what'd you go and do that for? Uh, I think Hess comes out smelling like roses in this one. So um, this is about eavesdropping. Uh, when we had the first crypto wars, it was about phones that looked like that. Some of you know these phones. I still have one on my desk, actually. That's a picture of the one on my desk. Um, now it's about phones that look like this. Um, but it's really about two different sets of issues. The first crypto wars was about publication. So when public key crypto came out, there were attempts by NSA to hold back publication of both that work and, future, and other work, future work in cryptography. That got settled actually quite amicably after a, few, a couple of years of discussion. In the 1980s, there were fights over crypto standards. The issue was, would NSA or NIST develop crypto standards for the non-national security agencies of the US government. For those of you not in the government, that sounds like an obscure argument. For those of you in the government, you get it right away. If, if NIST develops the standards, um, so first of all, let me tell you the import of the standards. The standards mean that any um, equipment sh sold to the federal government has to have that, st that crypto standard in it. Once uh, uh, federal uh, sales were about 10% of all sales at the time. So if something is 10% of sales, you put it in all your equipment. Once it's in all your equipment, then it's, um, then it's, uh, then other companies, companies will start to use it if they think it's a good standard. So uh, 
whether NIST was in charge or NSA was in charge, was really saying whether a civilian agency or a, uh, a military agency, I know it's not a military agency, a signals intelligence agency was going to be developing crypto standards that would be used by the public. Big fuss in Congress, and NSA actually got blindsided by the Computer Security Act, uh, which passed and said NIST would be in charge. However, what happened was there was a technical working group. The technical working group had three people from NIST, three people from NSA. If they had disagreements about whether a standard should be approved, they went to the Secretary of Commerce and Secretary of Defense. If they had disagreements, it went to the National Security Council. You can imagine how often it went up. It didn't. And this kept, and NSA kept winning until the mid-1990s when uh, NIST when the NSA group was headed by uh, someone from Information Assurance. In the 1990s, the fight was over export controls. Uh, You probably all know about this, but at first the controls limited export to crypto with 40 bits. This is 40 bits symmetrically. Um, It eventually loosened, and in 2000, it, it changed both in Europe and the United States. In part, it changed because of Defense Department needs to use commercial off the shelf equipment. Um, that was the Klinger Cohn Act, but it was also things like ad hoc military coalitions. You have a coalition like NATO, those are trusted partners, you develop secure communication systems over time. You have ad hoc military coalitions like during the first Iraq war. These are countries that you don't trust. You might trust them this year, but you might not trust them a year from now. Buying commercial off the shelf equipment is the right way to go. We get to the second crypto wars going dark. So in 2000, the NSA agrees to a change in crypto, uh, in export controls, in part because they want to go to computer network exploitation and they get a big bunch of money. FBI is pretty upset about this and starts fighting. Fought through the 2000s, um, and then in 2010, got public about not being able to understand communications, end-to-end crypto, and, and began publicly talking about it. Um, and in 2015, it got real, FBI started talking about phones. But let me tell you a little bit about what people are saying about encryption and backdoors. And I picked some high-level people, like Michael Chertoff. Um, I think it's a mistake to require companies making hardware and software to build a duplicate key or backdoor, it, um, even if you hedge it with the notion there's going to be a court order. I talked to Chertoff in the course of writing my last book, and he said, people should do what they've always done in investigations. You get metadata from here, you talk to this guy, you investigate this way. Sure, the content is great to have if you can get it, but it's too risky. Or what Michael Hayden, former NSA director, said. He said, American security is better served with unbreakable end-to-end encryption that would be served with one or another front door, back door, side door, whatever you want to describe it. And it's not just in the US that you hear that. Uh, Jonathan Evans, ex-head of MI5 in the UK, says, I don't think we should weaken encryption. So you've got all of these people saying we shouldn't weaken encryption. And you've got the FBI arguing the other side. Um, But it's a curious thing that's going on about the end-to-end encryption as opposed to the locked phones. On the end-to-end encryption, there are two barriers to restricting use. One is, how are you going to prevent that software? Maybe you could try and prevent the software from coming in by bits across the border. But are you going to inspect every mobile device as it comes across the border to see what apps somebody has downloaded when they've been somewhere else? It's not feasible. And furthermore, I heard recently under Chatham House rules, so I can't tell you who it is, a senior law enforcement official, a senior U.S. law enforcement official, who said, look, within a, within a decade, Chinese equipment is going to be within U.S. telecom infrastructure, just the same way it is already. Huawei supplies uh, telecom infrastructure in the U.K. He said, with Chinese equipment within U.S. telecom infrastructure, you have to have end-to-end encryption for security. So I think what's really going on um, is that uh, the fight on end-to-end encryption, when you hear it publicly from law enforcement, is really a bargaining chip. And where they're really fussing about is uh, locked phones. So when Apple introduced the phone in 2006, very expensive little device that was really easy to grab out of somebody's hand just before the subway door closed and, and jump off the subway car, you got the phone. The person who owned it was moving to the next station. Um, 
Apple instituted activation lock and find my iPhone, and theft of phones really dropped. But then there was theft of data. And in the late 2000s, Chinese hackers found a way to get data off of lost phones and stolen phones. Um, and that data was very useful for identity theft. And in fact, the hack itself was useful because the Chinese hackers put up, sold videos of, uh, sold information on how to hack the phones to get the data off. They sold it to criminals outside China. And that's when Apple began putting protections on data on the phone um, through encryption. And what they did is they entangled the user pin with the device key. Uh, they began doing, the first protection was at, over email. And a year later, they did it for all data on the, 95% of data on the phone. And they did it to secure the data on the phone. Remember that phrase, secure the data on the phone. So you keep hearing from law enforcement, this is an issue about security of, of, of people, public safety versus privacy. If you think about data on the phone, what's on the phone? There's photos, um, there's your travel log, there's what music you listen to, there's your contacts, there's your text messages, there's your banking app. This is not about privacy. This is about security. I want to talk to you now about movies for a moment. I don't know how many of you have seen this film. It always amazes me when I give this talk. I show the, the Sony poster for the interview, and I actually find people who have seen it. I read the review and never did. Um, if you think back to the hack against Sony, Sony was not applying good information security. If you think about banks back in the 1960s and 70s, banks got it that bits were money. You don't protect bits, you haven't protected money. In the 2010s, Films are bits. Sony is not producing canisters of films. It's producing bits. If bits are your product, you don't put the films on the corporate network. You put two-factor authentication on your system. You do all these things, but that's not how Sony was thinking in 2014. It is how Sony is thinking now. So why do you lock phones? Well, the best form factor we have for two-factor authentication is phones. Now, I know many people in here have Yubi keys and so on. You are not normal people. <laughs> in case you didn't know it, you are not normal people. Um, everybody, or everybody in modern society, uh, with the exception of my sister in law, carries a smartphone. Um, they carry a smartphone, they know where it is, they know when it's missing. It's a great second factor authenticator. There are ways to use it as a second factor authenticator, and there are ways not to use it as a second factor authenticator. Ways, to, uh, ways not to use it, don't use SMS. Why not? Um, for those of you who heard um, Bala's talk yesterday, uh, Vijay's talk yesterday, you know about uh, phones getting stolen and so on. Uh, Black Lives uh, uh, activist uh, McKeeson uh, during the election found all of a sudden his Twitter account was tweeting all sorts of very positive things about Donald Trump. He had two-factor authentication on his phone, but somebody went and switched the phone number so that it, uh, the authentication went somewhere else and somebody else had taken over his Twitter account. Last summer, uh, Bitcoin operators, uh, that is bit people who had lots of large Bitcoin accounts who had been using SMS as their second factor authenticator found that they lost control of their accounts. Um, NIST deprecated SMS a couple of years ago, then got some pushback, and the word is not deprecated. If Donna were here, I'd ask her the exact word. But the fact is, it doesn't matter whether it's deprecated or not. It's not secure. What is secure? What's secure, and there, there are other apps than these, what's secure is having an app on your phone, a piece of software on your phone that calculates something that you input as your second factor. Why the piece of software? Because you have the phone, you control where the phone is. Um, now, what happens if, if phones are made easy to hack? That is, if you have exceptional access into phones. That is, if it is easy for law enforcement and therefore others to open phones. What happens is, as you all know, there's no difference between data and programs. These apps become less secure. 
But if phones are hard to get into, how do you do investigations in the digital age? So I wanted to walk you through a couple of investigations. The first one is from 2005. Um, in, on July 7th, 2005, uh, terrorists in the UK, in London, set off bombs on three underground uh, trains and one bus, killing uh, probably 100, I don't remember, and injuring hundreds. Uh, they were killed, of course, in the attack. Two weeks later, there were uh, a copycat group of five. One of them chickened out, left his bomb in a park. Nothing happened to it with it. The other four got on three underground trains and a bus. Um, they tried to set off their bombs. They didn't have very good trade craft. They had a tiny explosion, which sh showed everybody around them that they were trying to set off bombs. But that tiny explosion did not set off the big bomb. What happened to those four is that the UK, and London in particular, has lots of CCTV cameras. So that's a picture of the four of them before they separated. The UK then put up photos of them on BBC, on all the news sites, tele, uh, uh, newspapers, and so on. One of them um, put on a burqa. He was six foot two. He put on a burqa. He went to the bus station in London, took a bus to Birmingham. Nobody thought anything about a six foot two person in a burqa. Uh, he got to Birmingham. He walked, he stayed somewhere in Birmingham, but two days later he took off the burqa as he was walking about and um, he was recognized and arrested. To another pair, one of them was recognized by their family. The family got in touch with the police. The police knew the apartment, went to the apartment, and found two of them together and arrested them. The fourth one is the most interesting one. The fourth one um, went to the south of England, then came back to London, got a brother's passport, a brother-in-law's phone, and so on and so forth, went to Paris, uh, Milan, Rome. Um, he had a brother staying in, in Rome. The police knew where the brother was, went and actually picked him up because they'd been trailing the phone all along, okay? It, uh, that's the kind of thing that people, uh, the police do in investigations. If I'd asked you 20 years ago, do you want to carry a radio beacon with you at all times, all of you would have done exactly what whoever it was did. But let me tell you about a, a more complicated investigation. Um, Harari had been prime minister of... Uh, Lebanon. He got into conflict with Syria. He resigned his position and decided then, a few months later, he would run again. Um, the Syrians warned him about running again. Uh, he nonetheless was going to do it. He stopped by Parliament one day uh, to meet with legislators. Then he found out uh, a UN he was about to get back into his car when he noticed uh, somebody from the UN that he, who was told somebody from the UN was nearby. He went to meet with that person in a coffee house, got back in his car. His car, of course, was part of an entourage uh, surrounded by security people. Um, they drove a, a little ways, were hit by a moving truck bomb, and he was assassinated. Uh, this is a picture of his route and the truck bomb. An investigator started looking at cell phone tracks and found there were five sets of cell phones, and I'm not going to be able to remember what purple and green and blue and so on did. One was the head group, and they communicated with the other groups, and that's all they did. Another group tracked Harari. A third group also tracked Harari. In each of the groups, the head of the groups, let me call them green and purple, communicated with each other and with the head group, but they did not communicate with anybody else. Within the group, they only communicated within the group. A fourth group was in the truck bomb, and I don't remember what the fifth group did. By following the trail of the phones over a period of months before the assassination, because the phones went dead after, the investigator was able to completely reconstruct the, the crime, including where they had bought the truck and so on. Where they bought the truck, by the way, was somewhere that um, had no CCTV cameras. And I'm sure that was not accidental. Let me give you one more. The Security and Exchange Commission checks that there's not insider trading. It does investigations much the way law enforcement does investigations on uh, organized crime. They try to flip low-level people and go up. In this case, they got a tip about uh, the Galleon group, whose head was Rajaj Ratnam. Um, 
And they went to see him, and they you know, chatted with him for a while and chatted some more and so on, and they did what investigators do, which is just when everybody's tired and they say, let's have a bathroom break, maybe get some coffee, um, come back in 20 minutes and keep it up, and as everybody's standing up, they say, oh, by the way, do you know somebody named Romy18, with a handle Romy18? And he says, oh, yes, uh, uh, and I've forgotten exactly what her name is, Romy Khan, I think. Um, well, that was very interesting to the SEC investigators because Romy Khan had sent him a message that said, do not buy PLCM, PLCM till I had guidance. That's not a typo, that's what it said. I mean, it is a typo, but it's not my typo. Um, and so they went to see Romy Khan next. And of course, they had the goods on her. She wore a wire. And that's how we get to the point that they were 35 people convicted with him getting an 11-year sentence. If you go back to that instant message and you think back 20 years ago, there wouldn't have been an instant message. She would have called him. He, they would not have yet been under investigation. That would have been an ephemeral communication. I can't do in my 40-minute talk, uh, not only because I am not a law enforcement investigator, but because... Um, because I couldn't do it even if I were a law enforcement investigator with, with all that they know about how to do investigations. I can't go through every piece of tools that are using, they're using, but let me tell you about some of them. Of course, communications metadata, who went where when, that is extremely useful for finding bank robbers, for finding the, uh, the, the kid who, oh, kid, uh, the guy who, uh, hired masseuses in Boston and then robbed them and in two cases killed them. He was picked up through the cell phone locate, matching cell phone locations. Um, communications metadata is incredibly valuable. Com uh, pic the Comey picture. We know about lawful hacking, the use of a, a vulnerability, whether it's in a website, um, uh, architecture, and then you can put a network intrusion tool on it and figure out who's using, who's accessing the website, and that's how you track p kids, people who are accessing child porn. We know about the use of it in other kinds of cases as well. The FBI has been using lawful hacking since the, the early 2000s. It's a very useful tool, but I do not want to oversell it in part because it's a very expensive tool. It's a custom tool. So it's a tool that the FBI and law enforcement will have to use um, in certain cases, but it's a, a rarely used tool, and it needs to be that way. Um, closed circuit television camera, uh, uh, sorry, automated license plate readers. One of many types of data that's picked up about you as you traverse the streets. When I was writing the book, I talked with Palantir, and they said, um, there's a case where police were tracking somebody with a quarter, they were tracking them, they were following them on automated license plate readers, so they started following where they were going on, by following the cell phone towers. And they noticed there was another phone traveling with that, that party. Every time the first phone showed up, the second phone showed up, the second phone showed up, the second phone showed up. They found a second person. Now, if you think about the labor involved if you think about the labor involved in order to, uh, to do that kind of tracking, um, with pol in the old days, what you'd do is you'd have 30 policemen over the space of a week because you need five teams to follow because you need to trade off. Otherwise, the bad guys say, hey, who's that red car? He's been behind us for the last half hour. And every time we switch lanes and change exits and get off on exits, you need them 24-7. You're replacing that by automated license plate readers, a program, cell towers, a program. Kevin Bangston and Ashkan Sultani have a paper that describes how the cost in hundreds of dollars have dropped to pennies, essentially. And then finally, of course, our friend Alexa and Echo. Um, but there are other techniques, too. Uh, all of you know about Grayshift and Celebrite uh, that sell tools to hack into phones, because no matter how hard Apple tries, they haven't been able to secure their phones. You notice I said Apple. Android, Google is also trying. Um, but Android is a more complicated picture because it's an open source program and each manufacturer implements in a different way. So even when Google does certain things, it's not clear how well they get carried out later. 
But the point is that there are commercial tools available for law enforcement to open phones. They're expensive, but they exist. So what do you need for investigations in the digital age? Well, you need a whole bunch of things. First thing you have to know in, during the digital age is that a high percentage of crimes have a digital component. It doesn't mean that the digital component is part of the crime, it's that the digital component might have evidence. Far more data is concentrated at the service providers than used to be. And sometimes it's at multiple service providers, which makes a complicated picture for law enforcement. Our laws and collection on surveillance predate the digital age. They don't deal with complexities like the following silly one. Okay, silly because I don't have time to go into the more complicated ones. The silly one is maps.google.com is an address that is collectible by law enforcement under what's called a 2307D order uh, relevant to an ongoing investigation. Google.com slash maps, the Google.com part is, but the slash maps is a message to the Google server. It needs a warrant. Okay? Um, there are, that's the easy example. There are actually many, many much more complicated examples. Um, sorry, did I miss something? Ah, yes. So uh, investigations in the digital age, CSIS did a report that came out recently that talked about how much law enforcement needs help, um, and they go to state and local laboratories 58% of the time, um, FBI field offices 45% of the time, and so on. That looks really impressive how often they involve people who know what to do. I looked at numbers from 2016, and in 2016, the regional forensic labs, which is the 33% number, did 6,000 investigations. That sounds really cool for state and local. That sounds really cool, right? There are 18,000 state and local police forces in the United States. Okay, this is just a drop in the bucket for what they need. So how should they do? They need to retool to become an investigative agency of the digital age. What does that mean? That means that they have to assume all investigations have a digital component and start to think that way. They have to enhance outreach to industry so that they know what industry is doing before the products come out and they think about how to do an investigation. They need to, but the really big thing is that they need to have much better sharing between federal and state and local. If you talk about the UK, there are 49 police uh, units, 49 police forces in the United Kingdom for a country that's a fourth the size of the US. 49, 18,000, very different. If you think about FBI capabilities, FBI capabilities are, there are some very good people there, but they're not at the size they need to be. But the state and local don't have the capabilities that the feds do, and they're not having proper information sharing. I'm talking here not about the feds taking over the case. I'm talking about the feds providing technical tools. More funding is part of it, but there's also the piece that we don't hear about and that, and, and that I think law enforcement and, is not thinking about, which is what are the investigative priorities? Street crime in the United States is way down from 20 years ago. Pick any crime you like. The numbers are way down. Violent crime is way down. Number of criminals is not way down. A lot of crime has migrated online. When you migrate crime online and you know, go to the Weiss Conference, Workshop in Economics of Information Security, or some of the talks here, and you hear the numbers about criminal activity, what happens when credit card number is stolen, used from Kazakhstan, purchases something in Bulgaria, from Bulgaria, um, and so on and so forth. And law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, is not only not equipped to do it, but the US has not thought about what are our investigative priorities in the face of such issues. 10 years ago, the security computer, the economics and security community said, hey, digital crime is not so bad. Well, one of the things about doubling is at some point, all of a sudden, the curves change. And we're in a different place now. But law enforcement hasn't caught up. So having talked about all that, I want to briefly introduce the Academy's report. I was part of an Academy's committee. I am not speaking officially on the, uh, for the Academy's. I'm speaking on my interpretation. Uh, we were asked to analyze trade-offs 
that should be that need, what kind of trade-offs should legislators look at when they're thinking about the encryption debate? We had incomplete data from law enforcement. They couldn't actually tell us the impact. They could tell us so many phones locked. They couldn't tell us what type of investigation. They couldn't tell us whether they used alternative methods. They couldn't tell us how much those alternative methods cost. Um, we also had limited ability to measure the security risks. Um, our charge was to study the trade-offs and provide a framework, a set of questions. We were explicitly not to reply uh, to supply recommendations of what to do, so we didn't. So what are our questions? First question, is a proposed solution effective? Is it scalable? Can it be timely? Is it reliable? Will it affect the security of the data and the device? And will it affect the security and data of everybody's devices? How will it affect privacy and civil liberties, not only of the targets, but of everybody else? How will it affect commerce, innovation, economic competitiveness? What are financial costs and who bears them? To what extent is the approach consistent with current laws and other government priorities? If you think back to the Obama administration, Secretary Clinton talked about an open internet, an open network. You make it easier to surveil, that, you make it really hard to hide communication, and that's really contrary to the view that was being espoused uh, a, uh, uh, a presidency ago. To, how does international context affect the approach, and how are you going to do effective evaluation and oversight? So one of our points was that adding exceptional access obviously, obviously weakens security to some degree. Lack of it hampers investigations. Well, duh. Uh, but how much is security reduced? Is it acceptable? Depends on the technical and operational details of the mechanism. This is obvious to you guys. The solution one has affects the security for everybody. It is not obvious to non-techies. It is not obvious to legislators that you actually have to look at the details of the solution. It's an important point that we constantly need to get across. And uh, we, look, we don't know the cost of when, uh, to society when investigations are hindered. During the um, study, we saw three people who claimed to have ideas about how to do exceptional access. Um, they were not fully fleshed out, they were not tested, they were not deployed. And when I say claimed to have ideas, what I mean is we saw single investigators coming with a slide deck. We did not see implementations, we did not see an engineering team, in, and in no case did we see a full architecture. Uh, I'm talking to a security conference, not a crypto conference. You know the difference between a paper idea and a, and a fully fleshed out architecture. Some of you may have caught the article in Wired by Ray Ozzy. Ozzy was the developer of Lotus Notes. He was software VP at Microsoft. He believed that he had an approach to doing exceptional access, and he briefed the Academy's committee. The Academy's committee was neither authorized nor constituted to come up with a security evaluation of Ozzy's approach. But I went to him after his briefing and I asked him if I pulled together a group of the usual suspects, would he be willing to talk to us? And he graciously said yes, and I think that's, that's pretty gracious of him actually because he knew that I was coming in with a lot of doubts. Now his proposal, his original proposal was for end-to-end -end encryption and locked devices. After we met with him, the end-to-end -end encryption seemed to drop away, and it was only for locked devices. The model was that a key on the device would be wrapped by an encryption by the manufacturer's key. Law enforcement would go to the manufacturer and uh, with a warrant, and then, you know, through a key exchange, uh, the key phone would be opened, and it would then become bricked. So the owner of the phone would know that the data on there has, was being surveilled. Uh, and the phone couldn't be used anymore. Um, it was a proposal for how to retrieve the key securely. And that's a theme here. This is a security problem. I want to know how authentication is working. 
How am I going to authenticate those 18,000 law enforcement offices? What happens when the phone travels internationally and there are 120 or 200 countries that want to have the same capability and so on? During our meeting with Ozzy, uh, well, actually, the first thing did not come from our meeting with Ozzy. Ozzy presented at Columbia. And during his talk, Aaron Tromer, a uh, cryptographer from Tel Aviv, came up with a spoofing attack, a way for criminal groups to get law enforcement, to get the manufacturer, to give the key back to law enforcement, which would actually go back to the criminal group, and they could open a phone, like a phone belonging to somebody, uh, like a CEO or somebody else with a lot of money. The technique is not resistant to jailbreaking. From the point of view of the academy study, those questions about effective, scalable, how does it affect the security of targets, non-targets, none of those were answered. Furthermore, it was a moving target. As I explained, when he briefed the academy's committee, it was end-to-end -end encryption and locked phones. After we talked with him, it became locked phones. The people involved in this are Steve Bellavin, Matt Blaze, Dan Bonet, uh, myself, and Ron Rivest. I'll have a slide with this up at the end so you can get more details. Um, but I have one more thing that I want to bring to your attention before I move from the um, Academy's report. And that's a point that the report made about smartphones. It said, well, if you make smartphones easier to hack into, then they're going to be, there's a good chance they'll be less good for other functions like secure authentication, multi-factor authentication. It's pretty important to me that that point made it into the report. And I also want to say, I'm not the one who wrote it. I, some, we all agreed to it, but I'm not even the one who wrote it. So I have one more reason to encourage, well, I have many more reasons, but one more that I'll leave you with to encourage cryptography's use. This is the ODNI, the Office of Director of National Intelligence report from um, January 2017. Now, all of you knew about the part where it says Russian intelligence collected against US primary campaigns. Everybody's paid a lot of attention to that. There's another part there. It says think tanks and lobbying groups they viewed as likely to influence US public policy. You're all computer scientists. Maybe one or two of you are lawyers. There's probably not a political scientist in the room. So let me tell you political science 101 or 102B. Uh, 102B is that democracies need civil society in order to function. If you have a non-representative democracy, that is, if you have direct democracy, everybody judges everything and makes decisions together. None of us live under such governments, except maybe in a family, and usually not even then. Um, but, but within uh, representative democracies, you have a whole layer of civil society that functions as the glue between the people and the government. They translate what the government policies mean about abortion to the people, what, what is happening on the streets to minorities, to the government. They produce reports, whether it's the American Cancer Society or the National Academy of Sciences. They uh, produce information about the environment, um, all sorts of social cohesion. You have a weak civil society and democracy uh, flounders. It's something the Soviets and the Russians know really well. When the Soviets came in in 1917, that was one of the first things they eliminated. When the, Russia, when the Soviets came in to, um, to Eastern Europe at the end of the Second World War, yes, they assassinated political leaders in Poland and, and uh, East Germany and Czechoslovakia. They also worked to eliminate civil society. They were always worried about the impact of the Catholic Church in Poland. And when there was a Polish pope, that was something that was very dangerous for them. They couldn't get rid of the Catholic Church in Poland. They weren't able to. That was a strong civil society that worked against them. Um, so now go back and think about what the impact is when the Russians go after groups like these. These are groups that do not have the ability to, uh, they don't have money, they don't have tech support, they don't have the ability to secure themselves against a strong nation, against a nation state. So the importance of consumer grade, strong forms of authentication, strong forms of encryption are critical. What happens when a National Academy's committee report gets its data slightly changed just before it comes out? 
or emails. We all know about the flippant way we talk in emails, or emails from Sierra Club or Southern Poverty Law Center, or the PTA get distributed. The respect for those organizations, their ability to function gets very rapidly destroyed. And yes, we have seen Russian actions against such groups already. So the going dark debate is not a debate about privacy versus security. Um, it's really about efficiency of law enforcement investigations versus personal business and national security. I was at a meeting earlier in the week where a member of a national security agency said, we're, we're not doing a very good job of informing law enforcement how to go from a model where you arrest the guy, you get his device, you open it, you get data, to there's another way to do the investigation that's maybe not as straightforward but will work, and we need to do a better job. And right after that, I heard two members of law enforcement say, we need it to be straightforward. We just have to have it straightforward. We want that data. It should be straightforward. They couldn't hear it. They're trying to do 21st century investigations with 20th century approaches. And the problem is we have all sorts of 21st century attacks against our infrastructure and our infrastructure, not just our physical infrastructure, but our social infrastructure as well. So it's really about efficiency of law enforcement investigations versus personal business and um, national security. It's really a debate about security versus security. And so what I talked about is my new book, and I happen to have a flyer with 25% off over in the flyer table, um, the CSIS report, which is the low-hanging fruit report, the Academy study, which you can get for free off the web, and the clear protocol analysis that uh, Steve, Matt, Ron, and Dan, and I did. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. We will post um, notices about uh, the GREPSEC, uh, the conference, the workshop is for women and underrepresented minorities. Applications are due in January. That is, we will post things about it in January and applications are due. And the announcement of who's in, we have full travel support for whoever comes, will come out at the same time as travel for IEEE security and privacy. End of ad. <laughs> now you can ask questions. Okay. Thank you, Susan. So uh, uh, questions, please come up to the mic in the center in the front. Uh, state your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Husted, U.S. Navy. Uh, is the na did law enforcement make any statements that they feel the national security apparatus is being uh, appropriately supportive of their endeavors, given the legal uh, opportunities that law enforcement has of leveraging such things? Um, I got told by somebody in national security um, uh, a couple of years ago that after the Snowden uh, disclosures, every time NSA had to go up and testify on the Hill, FBI sat with them. And so they weren't going to talk about this, which is, I think, an answer. Uh, everybody who spoke about this, all the quotes I have are from retired people. Now, not everybody retired from, uh, from the intelligence agencies has made a statement like that. And not everybody agrees with those. But I think it's telling that there is no such statement. And in fact, their National Security Council documents from, I think, 2008, I could look up the site later, um, that say encryption is the way to go. There were discussions under the Obama administration that said, let's not legislate on encryption, again, from the National Security Council. Um, so you have commerce and state on one side, but clearly, if national security were on the other side, we wouldn't be getting quite the same things out. Uh, Simpson Garfinkel, U.S. Census Bureau, though this is a personal comment. Um, so, Susan, when you were talking about the truck bombing in Lebanon, you said that they went back and looked at where those phones had been over the previous few months. And when you talked about the police, I think in the U.S., that were following one cell phone, they noticed another cell phone was traveling with it. Well, if you want to be able to go back in time like that, you need to be doing continuous surveillance of every single phone and recording those positions for a long period of time. And that's the kind of surveillance that we typically haven't wanted to do without having warrants or So, stuff. Um, uh, in fact, I mean, there's a complicated answer to that. When the USA Freedom Act passed in 2015 in response to the Snowden disclosures, 
The idea was that instead of the NSA collecting comms metadata for the United States, the data would reside at the, uh, the telcos. If the telcos had less than eight, decided not to keep those business records for 18 months, that is the model was they were keeping it for 18 months, if they decided they did not want to keep it for that long, everything came back for renegotiations. So the point is, the telcos were keeping it for 18 months. AT&T, back when it was old Ma Bell, was keeping it for a lot longer. Um, so they were keeping it for their own purposes. Um, that's uh, one piece of the answer, and I had another part that has slipped well, well, out of Well, let my... me push on that. So mm -hmm. most users are probably not aware that they're geolocation information is being kept for 18 months at that level of detail. Well, actually, most users are probably not aware of the amount of geolocation that data that Google and other companies have, which is far finer than that. Um, yes, they are not aware. Uh, the point is that that was a negotiation settled in Congress about that particular issue. But the rest of it is the Carpenter decision, which said, you want seven days of location data? You need a warrant. No more 2703 data, D data. We don't know if you need a warrant for one day, if you need a warrant for three days, because that hasn't come up for adjudication. Um, yes, I agree completely that location data is remarkably revelatory. There's a wonderful paper by Jonathan Mayer, uh, Patrick Mutchler, and uh, John Mitchell that talks about this. Um, but that is data that has been at the telcos for a long time. It is now being kept by lots of others, um, uh, but it, is, it has been at the telcos for a long time and mined in various ways for a long time. Our final question, Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa Teague, University of Melbourne. The you gave a great talk on Tuesday at a workshop, by the way. Thank you. You gave a great talk today. <laughs> I, I did not know what I was doing. I wasn't trying to fish. So the draft Australian bill that was recently released has a clause that says that a technical assistance notice may apply to assisting the enforcement of the criminal laws in force in a foreign country. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, um, does that mean that Australia is going to help China, especially with the close economic relationship that your country has? I, I think that's one huge issue, yes. Um, and so it's easier for the U.S. to say, well, gee, we would never do that, but it's much harder for Australia to. Um, I, uh, we always point, unfortunately, to Australia as a place to be really worried about uh, mm -hmm. because there's both a very conservative move there and yet it's one of these English-speaking countries that's part of the Five Eyes and that could be the tipping point. So I think I've given you my answer. Yep. It's quite I, dangerous. I, I agree with that very much. Um, the other interpretation that struck me is that it's for helping the US because there's no mention of insisting upon a warrant or insisting that the um, request for help comes with proper processes in the source country. Um, well, under the Cloud Act, there has to be an agreement. You know, so we're replacing MLATs with the Cloud Act. And under the Cloud Act, there has to be an agreement that this country satisfies certain requirements and so on and so forth. It's determined by the executive and not by Congress, which is particularly worrying right now, but we don't even have one with the UK yet, which is supposed to be the first one. So I don't think it's going to roll down immediately, yeah. but it's hard to know, especially if we end up with uh, eight of six more years. Thank you. All right. Well, let's thank uh, Susan Landau again.